Alrighty then, welcome to part two of lecture 19. And we're going to talk about just one arthropod borne bacterial disease. So a disease that's spread by some kind of bug. The general theme of these diseases is the following. Number one, you have a vector. In this case, we're going to talk about a biological vector. It's an arthropod bug, and it carries a bacterium basically between several hosts. And humans are considered a host. Another host might be a horse or a bird or a squirrel. And the bacterium, though, is carried by the bug, the arthropod, all right? And it reproduces inside that arthropod. And we say, in that case, it's a biological vector, okay? So the vector basically carries the bacteria from one host, usually a human, to another host. The bacteria enter the human via the bite of the vector, so that's something true of all of these. The bacteria then reproduce and cause a disease in the human being. And usually there's no human to human transmission. The bacteria don't go from one human to another human being. Usually another biological vector will bite that human who's a reservoir and then take the bacteria from that reservoir you know, and then transfer it to another host, either a human or a bird or whatever, horse or whatever and so forth. Okay. So now let's talk about our one and only example of an arthropod borne bacterial disease, which is Lyme disease. Focus on Lyme disease. Uh, Lyme disease, like I said, it's growing in prevalence. And um, it's first of all, it's caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. It's a gram negative spirochete. So remember, you know, gram negative spirochetes, those are the ones that uh, jump around like pogo sticks, okay, of axial filaments. A little cocktail about the name. How do you get a name Burgdorferi? Well, this bacteria was discovered by a scientist in Montana, and his name was a Willie Burgdorfer. So to pay him tribute, they named a horrible bacterium after him. Uh, so his name would always be synonymous with pain and suffering. Uh, secondly, there are parts of California where this disease is endemic. Uh, the main one is Marin County. This picture is from Marin County, uh, just a little north of San Francisco. And so if you go hiking up there, beautiful area to hike, lovely. But as it says in the sign, beware of the ticks because that's the vector we're going to be talking about for Lyme disease. So. So Borrelia burgdorferi, all right, let's talk about it. Uh, it's mutagenic, meaning from goes from one generation to another. It'll change its surface proteins. So we say the surface antigens change from one generation to the other in a small but significant manner. So it's not a big change, but it's kind of a mild change. So there are changes in the proteins on the surface. Remember, these are going to be the antigens for immune system. So we'll get back to that point in a little bit. The incubation time is about seven to 14 days. So it takes a little while till the back from the, when the bacteria enters your body till you start seeing symptoms and signs. And like I said, these symptoms and signs are very strange. So a little bit more about Borrelia burgdorferi. It's an invasive bacterium. So you want to think, yeah, it's going to go through many layers and go into the bloodstream. It um, doesn't have iron in its proteins. Borrelia burgdorferi is really kind of different in that where you think that you would have iron as a cofactor for proteins. In Borrelia burgdorferi, they use manganese, another metal. So if they don't, if the bacterium doesn't need iron, it needs manganese. Well, it, there's no need for it to go after iron. So that's why you don't see it express hemolysis. Right now, the bad part is that you know your innate immune system. One very common strategy to kind of keep bacteria at bay is to prevent them from getting iron. Remember the ferritins and lactoferrin; those sequester, they hide, cage up iron. Well, that's not going to work to deter Borrelia burgdorferi because it doesn't need iron. The bacterium, like I said lives inside a vector and this one it's the tick the tick is an intermediate 
um, it basically will have the bacteria in it and it will basically take uh, the bacteria from from the blood of mice deers and humans so you can imagine the tick okay this little guy or a little guy right here taking the bacterium from one host a deer or a mouse to a human being so there's your deer and here's someone spraying themselves like crazy because they don't they want to keep away they want the ticks to keep away from them so you'd say that then would you consider the tick a biological vector or a mechanical vector so remember the bacterium is going to be within inside the tick inside its body fluids it's a biological vector right okay a little bit first about the transmission um, so there's an animal host we start with a deer or a mouse they're like favored uh, hosts for the bacterium so actually the bacterium is in the blood of a deer or a mouse and the tick is not infected to begin with well the tick bites the deer or the mouse it picks up it gets infected with the bacterium and then a little later that tick um, is you know drops off that animal drops off that deer or the mouse in the tall grass and then a human being like you comes hiking through that tall grass maybe chasing after that deer to take a picture with your cell phone and unfortunately that tick jumps on you the human being and guess what it starts to bite you and suck on your blood and unfortunately what happens is it pays for that blood by giving you the bacterium as payment so the tick eats what they say a blood meal on you and deposits into your blood uh, spirochetes okay which are Borrelia burgdorferi so you can imagine here's the tick first landing on you and then after it's eaten its blood meal look it's just filled up gotten big and fat with your blood in the meantime that's when it's shooting in the Borrelia burgdorferi into your blood how long do you think it needs to go from here to here basically how long does it take for it to deposit a dose of Borrelia burgdorferi into your body how long must it feed for a few minutes a few hours I guess well the answer is at least 24 hours so at least a day 24 24 is the answer all right some books will say 36 but it's more than 24 okay so it takes a while for that tick to give you to basically inject you with enough of the bacteria to lead to Lyme disease so if you get bitten by a tick don't spaz out if you had gone hiking a couple hours ago and you see the tick just take it off don't worry it doesn't have enough time to give you enough Borrelia burgdorferi but let's say it does okay let's say it fed on you didn't really notice maybe it landed in your scalp you didn't notice it fed on you for over 24 hours and you're gonna get a dose and you're gonna get it well path the pathogenicity has basically three stages and I'm I'm gonna basically give you a combination of the symptoms and signs along with the pathogenicity okay simultaneously the first stage is called the early localized stage in 80% of cases with people with Lyme disease what's gonna be a very hallmark symptom or sign you're going to develop what's called a bullseye rash so it's pretty obvious to tell why they call it a bullseye rash because you usually have something in the middle and then they're radiating eight radiating out rings so they call it the bullseye in 80 percent of the time now what's going on here well the uh, bacteria is entering your body it's destroying damaging your tissue and your body of course causes inflammation all right and the bacteria are going out from that original bite outward okay so that's why you get this kind of bullseye ring well you're gonna get inflammation there what's the key not a surprise the key is the endotoxin remember it's a gram negative okay well like I said it's gonna take about at least 7 to 14 days and sometimes it can take longer I mean literally one to four weeks after the bite even up a month 
but usually it's one to two weeks after the bite, you'll see this bullseye rash. All right, and a person will have flu-like symptoms, a little fever, endotoxin, a little malaise, fatigue. What do you think of? Okay, nothing respiratory, but you get that achiness, that thing like, oh, I'm getting a flu. Now, this is only in 80% of the cases, folks, okay? And as you're going to see later, you're going to want to be in that 80%. You don't want to be in the 20% who doesn't have a bullseye rash. The second stage is called the early disseminated. And, you know, think disseminated, think it's going to disseminate through the body. It's going to become systemic. So the signs are fever and small rashes all over the body. Um, your heartbeat starts to get weird. Uh, there's um, inflammation around the meninges, around the brain. So bad headaches. Little areas of paralysis, for instance, in the face. Um, notice. Um, other kinds of neuropathy where there's nerve damage, nerve problems, including things like bad hearing, like for a, you start losing your hearing, okay? These are very disparate symptoms and signs. They don't all point to one thing, do they? They seem like all over the place, okay? Well, they can last quite a while. They'll start about two to, weeks after, two to eight weeks after the bite. So this is a little later. Okay, after the after the bite, after usually after the bullseye rash. What's going on here to give these symptoms and signs? Because like I said, they're so strange and so disparate. Well, the bacteria are going systemic. You have septicemia. They're going through your bloodstream. This is an invasive bacteria. And they particularly like to attack the nerves, the heart, and the skin. Okay, so look at these up here, yeah? Nerves, right? Well, why? Well, because they like to, the bacteria like to attack collagen-rich areas. Remember collagen, collagen, or gelatinous regions. Okay, a little cocktail conversation. You buy Jello, Jello gelatin. You know, Jello gelatin. And uh, well, why is it called what? What is gelatin? Well, it's actually collagen. It's Jello gelatin is actually made from what we talked about before, bones and things like that. And it's a protein. It's and it's collagen, but but when the when they kind of add water to it, it 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 basically forms a jello-like consistency. So, jello, gelatinous collagen. And so the bacterium likes to bind to collagen-rich areas. Where are collagen-rich areas? And for instance, in the nerve system lining, you see a lot of collagen. The heart lining, collagen. The joints, collagen. Um, skin also, collagen. Okay, why is this smart for the bacteria? Okay, what, 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 well, well, when it goes to the collagen, it's really good there at forming a biofilm. So remember biofilms, right? Glycocalyces, pili, they stick together, they make kind of a film. And why? Why is that so good? Because remember, biofilms are protective. The bacterium goes in a biofilm it's kind of got like goop around it and that protects it from things like antibiotics okay later we talk about antibiotics that's really going to be important so remember that and also protects them from immune system components like phagocytes so that's why these bacteria can persist quite a while in your body all right look one to four weeks then two to eight weeks and we're going to talk about things lasting a long time okay things lasting for months Okay, your immune system is going to go after this bacteria, but that's one problem that it's hard to get to because it likes to form biofilms, especially these collagen-rich areas. Here is a, a picture just kind of brings out early infection, okay, um, early localized. Here it is. Here's erythrum migrans. That's just bullseye. That's the bullseye rash, okay. Here's a picture of the tick. And these are the spirochetes, the Borrelia burgdorferi, right here. There you go. They're being injected in. Okay. And then they're, look, they're invasive. They're making their way through the tissues. And they're going to go into the blood. By the way, this is a hair from the skin. Okay. It's not a sperm. A lot of people think it's sperm. That's not a sperm. This is just the skin. That's a hair. So, and then what happens? Well, they're invasive. Where are they going to go? They're going to go in the bloodstream. So later in the infection, early disseminated, 
they uh, basically heart form infections, heart, skin, joints. So you get carditis, arthritis, which we'll talk about, joint pain, and f even facial palsy. Okay, that's like paralysis in the face and rashes. Okay, so here you see all these these little little sun things are places where the bacteria are attacking and causing these problems. Okay, septicemia, systemic. All right. We'll continue. Well, because of these weird array of symptoms, they don't point to something. And, and if you didn't have the bullseye rash, 20%, uh, people don't. If you don't have the bull and you get this weird array of symptoms, it's very hard for a medical professional to diagnose it. All right. So you might say, well, why can't the immune system fight them right away? Fight, you know, why doesn't you just get rid of it right away? Well, we already said one reason. One reason was because, okay, they're in these biofilms, right? But the other reason is that, and it's a more important reason, is these bacteria are somewhat mutagenic. They are changing their antigens to a degree, all right? And so that means if they're changing their antigens, that means those antibodies, for instance, aren't going to be good as binding them for a while. All right, so the body has to change with it. They have to come up with better versions. Same thing with cytotoxic T cells. All right, the the antigens changing, they're not going to be as effective. So the body has to kind of change with it to kind of catch up with it. And usually, unless the person is really immunocompromised, usually, yeah, the immune system will catch up with it. We'll figure out and kill the bacteria and eliminate it from the body. In most people, but some they don't. But nevertheless, even a normal person, it's going to take a lot, lot longer than many bacterial infections to get rid of because these bacteria are mutagenic. And secondly, the symptoms and the signs, they're often worsened because your immune system is really working hard to get rid of this thing. So it's almost a very exaggerated or very strong immune response. And sometimes that does more damage to the body than it actually does to the bacteria. So often you'll get bad inflammation in these areas where the body kind of overdoes it and trying to kill the bacteria, it ends up damaging the tissues. It's like you're trying to take out a sliver with a shovel, you know, you get that idea. So that's another reason why the symptoms and signs can be pretty darn bad. Your immune system overdoes it because it's so trying so hard to get rid of this nasty little character. So finally, we go to the late stage. In the late stage, there's bad arthritis and there's altered mental states. Okay, altered mental states. And it can last for many years. And um, when you say altered mental states, what are we talking about? Kind of just bizarre behavior, um, great depression, um, suicidal tendencies, right? I'm going to focus on the bad arthritis. Um, the reason they call it Lyme disease because it was kind of discovered in a place called Lyme, Connecticut. And what drove them to study this is because children, very young children, were developing arthritis. And you think arthritis, that's for elderly. But these kids were developing it. These kids were kind of playing in the woods. They were getting bitten by ticks. They were getting a Borrelia burgdorferi. It went through all these stages, went to a late stage, and the kids developed arthritis. So that's often what happens in the late stage. A person develops really bad arthritis along with depression, suicidal tendency, things like that. And there are people that thought they were going insane, but they actually had Lyme disease. Now, what's doing the damage? At this point, it's really, it's, it's, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not well understood. They're still trying to figure out. There's some hypotheses, but they haven't been proven. But the damage pretty much is often done by your own immune system. They consider kind of an autoimmune response because they'll see this damage being done pretty much once the bacteria are really low levels or after they've actually been cleared of the body. Like there's no bacteria left and the body's still damaging itself and leading to bad arthritis and some uh, mental problems. And also you see chronic inflammation, chronic, long term. Again, your own immune system and autoimmune response. So... Obviously, the hope is to stop it before it gets to the late stage, right? Uh, it's not usually fatal, but the, these late stage symptoms may never go away or take years 
to go away. So I'm thinking you should probably know why you want that bullseye rash. Because if there's that bullseye rash, they can diagnose you and hopefully they'll treat you and it'll never get to the late stage. So here's the treatment. Number one, if you get bit, like I said, remove the tick, apply a little antiseptic. If it's a few hours after you went hiking, it hasn't been there long, you shouldn't have to worry about it. Um, let's say you do come down with Lyme disease, they do diagnose you. What are they going to give you? Usually antibiotics, tetracyclines. Okay, that's the best one. That's the, the favored one. But really, it's only at stage one and stage two. It's only at that early localized and early disseminated. All right. If it's stage three, there's limited usefulness. Okay, limited because in stage three, sometimes there's very, very few bacteria. They're really not the problem. Or they're totally gone, and what's like I said, what's being the damage is being done by your own immune system, and they'll actually use immunosuppressants at that time, but antibiotics usually aren't that helpful at the at the third stage, the late stage. So I think now you know why you want a bullseye rash, right? Okay, right. A little bit about prevention. Um, don't get bit. Mm -hmm. um, when you go hiking in areas where Lyme disease is endemic, it's signs are posted, like that sign in Marin County. You wear long clothes. You put on DEET, which is a repellent for bugs, uh, which good, good insecticide. You know, you, you're really not supposed to wear shorts or short sleeve shirts. You're supposed to be covered up. Okay. Now, it's only found in certain parts of the U.S. That's why we say it's endemic to certain parts. And, and the worst is shown in like dark like magenta or, or black are places on the East Coast. You know, here's Connecticut. Here's Lyme, Connecticut. All right, that's, it's somewhere in there. Um, looking around the, the Great Lakes region, you can see them. All right, you're going hiking out here. Be careful. Um, most, a lot of the country, very, very low or no risk at all. And then you come to California and look, now you're getting in the medium risk areas. And here's, this one is Marin County. This is probably the most notorious in California. But how about this area here? Well, folks, Stockton's right about here. So this is just a little east of Stockton, in the foothills, certain mountains there. So if you're going to go out hiking, find out if, if Lyme disease is a problem. Because you don't want to get bitten by a tick, trust me. Okay. Uh, there's no person-to-person -person transmission. You don't have to worry about it, getting it from somebody else. It's only going to be the by the bite of a tick. Okay. And there's no vaccine. They actually did come out with a vaccine in the late 90s, but it did not work very well. So they pulled it off the market. So here's another example of, um, just as we talked about cholera, also for a Lyme disease, the vaccines were there. They didn't work that great. And they ended up taking, being taken off the market. So vaccines not always a guarantee, okay? Sometimes they just don't work that well. Okay, that's where we'll end it today. I won't have that much of a lecture on new stuff because during the live synchronous lecture 19, I wanna spend a good deal of time uh, reviewing for exam three. So please come to the live synchronous lecture 19 and bring some questions for the review session to prepare for the exam three which is on thursday take care folks thank you for listening bye bye